Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook. I am director of the Africa program here at CSIS. Uh, welcome to you all, and thanks uh, for coming to this afternoon's discussion, which is um, uh, focused on Nigeria, promise and peril and implications for U.S. engagement. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, um, Ambassador Johnny Carson, also Ambassador McCulley, who is here in from Abuja. Welcome to you as well. Um, Ambassador Carson is going to offer his perspectives on the challenges that Nigeria is currently confronting, I think the progress that has been made in tackling some of the long-standing issues, uh, and what he sees as the big opportunities and the big new directions for U.S. engagement in Nigeria. Next Monday will mark the one-year anniversary of the national elections that saw President uh, Goodluck Jonathan voted into the presidency of Nigeria. Uh, the year since has been a pivotal one and an eventful one, I think with notable progress in some areas, uh, but big challenges that have captured global attention uh, and that threaten, I think, not only the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of Nigerians, but the fabric of Nigerian society writ large. Uh, last year's elections in many ways foreshadowed um, this complicated year that, that has followed. The elections were procedurally head and shoulders above uh, the three preceding elections. Uh, the leadership of uh, Professor Jaga, head of the National Election, Electoral Commission, I think is an indication, was an indication of what, what strong leadership can do even in, within flawed institutions. Uh, significant mobilization of civil society, new use of technologies to ensure credibility and transparency. All of these, I think, uh, set a new bar of expectations for the integrity of the electoral process and kind of infused at that time, um, I think, hope into that the, the processes, processes, even in Nigeria, um, can, can, can change for the better. But despite being one of the best procedural elections, uh, the election's aftermath was one of the most violent of recent years. Uh, the, the, there remains the enduring and overweening influence of money in the election process, uh, the crisis of expectation and deepening regional rift that left many in the North angry uh, and resentful. And the subsequent year has likewise uh, been a deeply mixed picture, uh, promising momentum in tackling some of uh, the big areas that have held back Nigeria's growth and development, and in banking, uh, some movement in the power sector, uh, the fuel subsidy issue, and tackling the big vested interests in, in food and fuel importation, um, but the continuing challenges, um, the intractable vested interests, uh, political elite that in many ways is far removed from the concerns of ordinary Nigerians, uh, and escalating tax, obviously, um, by the violent uh, group Boko Haram, with yesterday's bombing in Kaduna, only uh, the, mo uh, the most recent in a series. Um, I'm going to keep it short because we want to hear from our guest of the day. There is no easy introduction for Nigeria. There's no easy policy solution. Um, but it really does matter uh, for Nigerians, I think for the region. We've seen a lot going on in West Africa. Uh, these past months uh, in Senegal, in Mali, and you need uh, a strong partner like Nigeria, which has played such a vital leadership role in the content continent in the past, uh, you need it kind of in full, in full form um, to tackle the big continental issues. Uh, and it matters for the United States. Uh, Nigeria, as Ambassador Carson has, has many times said, is one of our most important partners in the region um, for, for, for its size, for its, for its energy, for the energy of its population and the entrepreneurship of its, uh, of its people. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to Ambassador Carson, uh, who will give remarks, then we'll open it up for, for questions. Uh, Ambassador Carson, welcome, and um, delighted you could come to talk about this. Jennifer, thank you very, very much. It's always a very great pleasure and an honor to be here at CSIS. It's also uh, a great honor to uh, be here with uh, this, uh, this audience. Uh, I am uh, uh, very pleased and in many ways uh, humbled uh, 
by the uh, number of, of people who are uh, here who know so much uh, about uh, Nigeria and who care so much uh, about uh, that country. Uh, I think uh, you have mentioned that our ambassador uh, to Nigeria, Ambassador Terry McCulley, uh, is here. But we also uh, have uh, the uh, Nigerian ambassador uh, to uh, the uh, United States here with us as well. Ambassador Adefuye, glad to have you here with us this afternoon. But in addition to uh, the two ambassadors here, we've got uh, others who have served very uh, uh, distinguished uh, tours of duty uh, in Nigeria and in West Africa, including in Nigeria. And we have certainly Ambassador Howard Jeter and, and, uh, and Hank Cohen, former Assistant Secretary uh, of State, uh, who knows uh, Nigeria quite well, Mark Bellamy, another uh, of our distinguished colleagues. But even beyond that, I look out at the audience and the reach uh, is enormous. We have some of uh, the best scholars uh, on uh, Africa and Nigeria uh, in this uh, audience, John Payden, uh, Pauline uh, Baker, David uh, Smock, uh, and the number could, uh, in fact, uh, go on. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to uh, have all of you here, uh, uh, not only to listen to the presentation that I am about to make, but also I am sure in the question and answer period to offer both your questions, your comments, your criticisms, your insights, uh, and your reflections. All of that uh, is a useful uh, and very beneficial cocktail uh, for helping to both inform uh, us and to make better, better sense of what's happening and also to strengthen our policy. Uh, as Jennifer pointed out, a year ago almost to the day, Nigerians began casting ballots in the first of what would be four days of voting for legislators, governors, and for the president. Tensions were high. Voting that had been scheduled one week before was abruptly canceled shortly after the polls opened. We did not know for certain whether months of careful election preparation would result in a process considered free and creditable or a rerun of the deeply flawed 2007 presidential elections. Skeptics were everywhere, and many said that holding good elections in Nigeria were not possible. Nigerians had a different view. They waited in line for hours. They stuck around after the polls closed to ensure that every ballot was counted. They monitored polling places and compilation centers by the thousands, and they sent text messages reporting any irregularities that they saw. The result was clear. Nigeria conducted its most successful and creditable election since its return to multi-party democracy in 1999. Despite some obvious imperfections, these elections have given the country a solid foundation for strengthening its democratic institutions and also its governance. As a witness to those historic elections, I can vouch for the enthusiasm Nigerians demonstrated towards those electoral contests and the democratic rights that they were all exercising. Civil society groups across the country were actively engaged in the process. And on election day, diverse groups, including the Federation of Muslim Women, the Nigerian Bar Association, and the Transition Monitoring Group joined together in a massive election monitoring effort called Project Swift Count. There was also a strong commitment on the part of the government to improve the electoral process. Months before the election, a new and highly regarded independent national election commission chair was named, and the Nigerian government provided adequate funding 
to pay for those elections. The new INEC chair, Professor Jaga, made a good faith effort to follow the law, to register as many voters as possible, and to organize the elections in the shortest and most effective time frame. The April 2011 elections were clearly another step forward in Nigeria's continuing democratization process. But more work has to be done to improve Nigeria's electoral procedures, and more importantly, to strengthen the country's democratic institutions. We all, and I stress we all need to see a strong, vibrant, and growing Nigeria. Because what happens in Nigeria affects us all, the United States, Africa, and the global community alike. We cannot run away from the facts. Nigeria is probably the most strategically important country in sub-Saharan Africa. At about 160 million people, Nigeria is home to over 20% of sub-Saharan Africa's population. It is the largest oil-producing state in Africa. It is the fifth largest supplier of crude oil to the United States, and it is the 10th largest global producer. It is home to the sixth largest Muslim population in the world, and Nigeria's Muslim population is larger than any Arab state. In the United Nations, Nigeria is the fifth largest peacekeeping contributing country. And as the most influential and militarily powerful member of the economic com community of West African states, Nigeria has played a key role in helping to resolve every major political and security dispute in West Africa from the Liberian and Sierra Leonean crises of the 1990s to the more recent political problems in Guinea-Conakry, Niger, Cote d'Ivoire, and I might add to that uh, Mali. Nigeria is a dominant economic and financial force across West Africa. And if just one single Nigerian state, Lagos State, were an independent country, its population would make it the 18th largest country in Africa, and its economy would be well within the top 20 on the continent. Nigeria is important, and a lot depends on Nigeria's success. That's why Secretary Clinton inaugurated the U.S.-Nigeria Binational Commission in 2010, providing the two countries with a high-level vehicle to work together on the most critical issues that we face. We have supported Nigeria's political and economic reforms, and we have tried to be a useful partner as it addresses its social, economic, and security challenges. We provided technical assistance to support reform in the power sector. We've taken a large energy trade mission to the country, and we have encouraged the swift passage of a strong new petroleum industrial bill that brings more transparency to that critical sector. We have recognized the importance of Nigeria's agricultural sector and supported Nigeria's comprehensive agricultural development plans. And in the health sector, we have committed over $500 million a year to the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, demonstrating how critical we consider Nigeria in the worldwide fight against HIV and AIDS. President Obama and Secretary Clinton both recognize the importance of this relationship, and both have met and engaged with President Goodluck Jonathan on a number of occasions over the past three years. Later this week, Nigeria's Vice President will be in Washington, and he is expected to meet with Vice President Biden in the White House and with senior officials in the State Department. Nigeria's success is important to us, but we recognize 
That success cannot be achieved unless Nigeria overcomes the challenges that have frustrated its progress. Decades of poor governance have seriously degraded the country's health, education, and transportation infrastructure. Despite hundreds of billions of dollars in oil revenue, Nigeria has virtually no functioning rail system, and only half of its population has access to electricity. The 80 million Nigerians who have electricity share intermittent access to power equivalent to what we have and use here on a daily basis in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Living standards are the same today for most Nigerians as they were in 1970, and nearly 100 million Nigerians live on less than $1 a day. Nigerians are hungry for progress and improvement in their lives, but northern Nigerians feel this need most acutely. Life in Nigeria may be tough for many, but life in the north is grim for almost all. A UN study shows that poverty in the 12 most northern states is nearly twice that of the rest of the country. The health indicators reflect this. Children in the far north are almost four times as likely to be malnourished. Child mortality is over 200 deaths per, th per thousand live births, leading to lower life expectancy. Educational standards are just as bad. Illiteracy in the far north is 35%, as opposed to 77% in the rest of the country. 77% of women in the far north have no formal education, compared to only 17% in the rest of the country. In northern Nigeria, primary school attendance is only 41 percent, while youth unemployment is extraordinarily high. All of this contributes to joblessness and a deepening cycle of poverty. The statistics are disturbing, but they are not the whole story. Poverty in northern Nigeria is increasing. Despite a decade in which the Nigerian economy expanded at a spectacular 7% a year, the Nigerian National Bureau of Statistics estimates that extreme poverty is 10% higher than in 2004. It is even worse in the North. Income inequality is growing. These trends are worrying for economic, political, and security reasons. While 91% of Nigerians across the country considered the April 2011 elections to be fair and transparent, most people in the North backed opposition candidates that did not win. The post-election violence that Jennifer referred to that occurred in several Northern cities reflected strong dissatisfaction with the elites who protesters thought controlled the election process. Public opinion polls and news reports suggest there is a strong sentiment throughout the country, but especially in the North, that government is not on the side of the people and that their poverty is a result of government ne neglect, corruption, and abuse. This is a type of popular narrative that is ripe for an insurgent group to hijack for its own purposes. And this brings me to Boko Haram. As you all know, over the last year, Boko Haram has created widespread insecurity across northern Nigeria, increased tensions between various ethnic communities, interrupted development activities, frightened off investors, and generated concerns among Nigeria's northern neighbors. They have been responsible for nearly daily attacks in Bornu and Yoruba states. 
and they were behind the January 20 attack in Kano that killed nearly 200 people, as well as three major attacks in Abuja, including the bombing of the UN headquarters last August. And to underscore this, uh, there were two major uh, attacks uh, this past weekend. Boko Haram's attacks on churches and mosques are particularly disturbing because they are intended to inflame religious tensions and upset the nation's social cohesion. Although Boko Haram is reviled throughout Nigeria and offers no practical solutions to the country's problems, a growing minority of certain northern ethnic groups, however, regard them favorably. Boko Haram capitalizes on popular frustrations with the nation's leaders, poor government service delivery, and the dismal living standards that many northerners have to suffer under. Boko Haram seeks to humiliate and undermine the government and to exploit religious differences in order to create chaos and to make Nigeria ungovernable. Boko Haram has grown stronger and increasingly more sophisticated over the past three years. And eliminating Boko Haram probably will require a broad-based strategy that employs the establishment of a comprehensive plan rather than the imposition of additional martial law. While more sophisticated and targeted security efforts are necessary to contain Boko Haram's acts of violence and to capture and prosecute its leaders, the government must also win over the population by addressing the social and economic problems that have created the environment in which Boko Haram has been able to effectively thrive. The government must improve its tactics, avoid human rights abuse and excessive violence, make better use of police and intelligence services, de-emphasize the role of the military, and use its courts to effectively prosecute those who are found to be responsible for Boko Haram's kidnappings, killings, and terrorist events. Nigerian officials should focus on the political environment that makes Boko Haram so dangerous. By demonstrating the benefits that a pluralistic society has to offer, the government can deny Boko Haram and other extremists the ability to exploit ethnic and religious differences. The government should redouble its efforts to resolve ongoing disputes in Joss and other high violence flashpoints. By becoming more responsive to the people, the government can put distance between itself and the accusations that it is blind to the needs of northern Nigerians. Numerous northern civil society organizations have come out against Boko Haram at great risk, and they could multiply serious government efforts to address longstanding northern grievances. I want to take this opportunity to stress one key point, and that is that religion is not driving extremist violence either in Jos or northern Nigeria. While some seek to inflame Muslim Christian tensions, Nigeria's ethnic and religious diversity, like our own in this country, is a source of strength, not weakness. And there are many examples across Nigeria of communities working across religious lines to protect one another. Containing and eliminating Boko Haram today will be much more difficult than it was four years ago when it was under the leadership of the now deceased leader, Muhammad Youssef, who was killed in police custody. Today, Boko Haram is not a monolithic, homogeneous organization controlled by a single 
charismatic figure. Boko Haram is several organizations. A larger organization focused primarily on discrediting the Nigerian government, and a smaller, more dangerous group, increasingly sophisticated and increasingly lethal. This group uh, has developed links with AQIM and has a broader anti-Western jihadist agenda. This group is probably responsible for the kidnapping of Westerners and for the attacks on the UN building uh, in Abuja in August. Complicating the picture further is the tendency of some officials to blame Boko Haram for all bank robberies and local vendettas occurring in the north when these should really be ascribed to common criminals and political thugs. There are some who say that Boko Haram is comprised mostly of non-Nigerian fighters and that the group is being funded by a handful of resentful politicians nursing their wounds from the last election. This would be deeply unfortunate if true, but I have not seen any evidence to support either of these theories. To fix the Boko Haram problem, the government will have to develop a new social compact with its northern citizens. It will have to develop an economic recovery strategy that complements its security strategy. It will have to draw on the support of northern governors, traditional Hausa and Fulani leaders, as well as local NGOs and organizations. The Nigerian government should also consider creating a Ministry of Northern, Fa of Northern Affairs or a Northern Development Commission, similar, similarly to what it did in response to the Niger Delta crisis. Northern populations are currently trapped between violent extremists on the one hand and heavy-handed government responses on the other. They need to know that their president is going to go to extraordinary lengths to fix their problems. Achieving this will not be easy. Although the problems are not the same, it has taken the central government in Abuja nearly a decade to bring the problems in the Delta under a semblance of control. Resolving the problems in northern Nigeria will require the government to act more swiftly and to make a strategic course correction. It will need to adopt a comprehensive strategy and remain disciplined and committed to its implementation, especially at the state and local level where accountability and corruption is high. Let me move on. Despite the challenges that Nigeria faces with Boko Haram and with other issues, Nigeria is simply too important to be defined by its problems. Nigeria must be defined by its promise and its enormous potential, as well as the resourcefulness of its people. Although some political observers have accused the government of getting off to a shaky start after the elections, that is not a judgment shared by all, especially when you look at key players in President Goodluck Jonathan's cabinet. By all accounts, President Jonathan has put together one of the strongest and most competent economic teams ever assembled in Nigeria, and I might add, almost any other place in Africa. Finance Minister Dr. Ngozi Okonji Iweala, former president, vice president of the World Bank, has pushed a strong reformist agenda, pushing for an end to costly government subsidies, deregulation of the electricity supply and distribution, the sale of the country's oil refineries, and the rapid improvement of the country's infrastructure. She has been supported 
in her efforts by the central bank governor, Sanusi uh, Lamido Sanusi, uh, agricultural minister, Alhaji Bukar Tijani, trade and investment minister, Olusanjo Aganja, and the minister of power, Professor Bart Naji, all of whom have put a high premium on promoting sustained economic development, job creation, greater agricultural productivity, and more foreign investment. Given time and political support from the top, this team has the ability to shape and lead Nigeria's long-term economic transformation. It is one of the most powerful economic teams assembled anywhere on the continent. The Nigerian government has also taken a positive step in trying to address its longstanding problems of corruption. Through two strategic appointments, the government has signaled that it is once again going to try to get a handle on high-level corruption. For four years, the United States scaled back its technical assistance programs to the Nigerian Economic and Finance Crimes Commission, known as the EFCC, because we did not believe that the previous leadership was committed to reform. In November of last year, President Jonathan appointed a new chairman to run the EFCC, the country's main anti-corruption agency. The appointment of Ibrahim Lamorty, who's currently uh, in the United States and I believe in Washington, D.C., uh, was selected to lead the EFCC. And this gives us great confidence that the high-level corruption that has hobbled the delivery of government services will be seriously addressed under his leadership. President Jonathan's appointment of Nuhu Ribadu to oversee a commission to monitor and audit the government's vast oil and gas revenues is also a very promising sign. Before he was fired several years ago, Nuhu Ribadu had earned a well-deserved reputation as Nigeria's most zealous prosecutor of high-level corruption. His return, like that of Dr. Ngozi and the other economic reformers, should be taken as an indication of the promise and the potential of getting it right. We hope that these high-level performers will encourage others, like the Petroleum Minister, to accelerate key reforms, including passing the long-awaited Petroleum Industrial Bill. There is also a bright side to be found in the state houses across Nigeria, where governors are responsible for delivering most public services. A handful of governors embrace the, have embraced the challenges of their jobs and have made a real difference. The governors of Lagos State, of Edo State, and of Kano State have demonstrated that strong, honest, and responsible leadership at the state level can accomplish a great deal. They deserve our support. We continue to use the U.S.-Nigeria Binational Commission as our primary vehicle for engaging and, and exchanging ideas with Nigeria. We want to elevate and expand our dialogue and are ready to work with Nigerians at the national and at the state level to expand our programs in states with high-performing <coughs> executives, particularly in the north where the need is the greatest. We are committed to helping Nigeria develop a comprehensive counterterrorism counter strategy and to improving collaboration among Nigeria's intelligence uh, and security services. We want to support the Nigerian government's efforts, especially in the areas of agriculture, electri electrical power generation and transmission, and in anti-corruption. We sent a high-level 
Energy Trade Mission to Abuja and Lagos in February to attract U.S. private investment in the energy field. And we would like to do something similar to highlight the opportunities that exist in agriculture and in infrastructure, where we think we have something real to offer. The Agricultural Investment Forum, sponsored by the Corporate Council on Africa and the Nigerian Embassy, which starts tomorrow, similarly aims to direct U.S. resources towards Nigeria's development needs. I personally am bullish on Nigeria. I have been ever since I served there as a young foreign service officer many years ago. There is no doubt that Nigeria's challenges are serious, but we should not underestimate the skill and the ability of the Nigerian people and their leaders to address them. I believe the forces that are holding Nigeria together today are stronger, much stronger than the forces that are trying to pull it apart. Nigeria remains the giant in Africa, and I remain optimistic about the long-term future of that giant. By working with Nigeria, we can contribute to the country's economic growth and its political stability and unity, objectives that are important to the United States, to Africa, and to the global community. A strong, vibrant, politically stable, and economically prosperous Nigeria is in everyone's interest, and I hope you all agree with that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ambassador Carson, um, for really that uh, terrific and comprehensive um, perspective on, on the relationship and the challenges and, and the many opportunities that you point out. Um, we're going to open up for questions. I'll take probably three, um, three at a time, and then we'll come back and do, do a couple of rounds um, that way. Uh, yes, that's yours. Um, I guess uh, to start, I mean, you, you've talked about the, the big reforms that are, that are happening at, at the federal level, in banking, in, in power, um, in, in, uh, uh, in, in a couple of big sectors, and the hope being that eventually they kind of unlock the economic potential of Nigeria. But you also talked about the huge disparity between North and South. And I, I guess the question is, do those reforms, will they take effect quickly enough in some ways to have enough impact on the ordinary person that that begins to rectify the rift of, of North and South and make the ordinary Nigerian feel the benefit of those kinds of reforms. Um, if not, and it, um, many of those are going to take some time, do you see a, an expanded role for the United States, for example, in the North in, in regalvanizing some of those economies in terms of its development presence, uh, funding, outreach, and so forth? We've had a fairly limited presence um, in the north. And I, I, I wonder, given that this is our most strategic partner in Africa, given that it's at this pivotal moment, given the deep rifts that, that you've talked about and the deep disparity, do you see the United States doing more in that arena, in the development arena in, in the north? Um, well, let's take a couple of questions to come back um, to you and then go back around. Let's see, the gentleman uh, on, the, on the aisle, yeah. Please, and please uh, wait for the mic and identify yourself. you for the, the concern you've placed so much on Nigeria. Uh, you have mentioned so much concern for the North and being a Nigerian and presently based in Nigeria. 
I'm concerned about the definition of the North that you hold. Uh, where does that leave the central part of Nigeria? Uh, and how does the interests of America play to influence the growth of where we now define as Middle Belt? That's one. Uh, the second issue is the ethnic dimension that lies between these two regions, the far north and the middle belt. How much are you aware of the diversity of the ethnic people that lie within the area? I heard you mention the Hausas and the Fulanese. I am of the Tarok ethnic people based in Southern Plateau. And there are minority groups that are about 592 based in the North, like the Tarok people. I have not heard any conflict, ethnic conflict within similar minority ethnic people, except a conflict between the Fulani nomad, nomadic people and others. Okay. I don't know how much that will help the impression that the Americans are going to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's g just go uh, across the aisle and then we'll come to Connie and then we'll take those three and, and turn go. There and then, no, no, no. Yes, uh, my name is Emmanuel Ogebe. I'm a human rights lawyer uh, from Nigeria and with the US Nigeria Law Group. Ambassador, I'm a bit uh, confused because you mentioned that you're providing counterterrorism support to Nigeria. On the other hand, it is my understanding that you're refusing to designate Boko Haram a terrorist group. So what exactly are we providing that support to Nigeria for? From what you've just described, Boko Haram would not be eligible for a Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, secondly, Ambassador, I should point out a factual error in your statements. I reviewed the list of car bombings that have occurred, uh, published by the AP, and from everything I have seen, there was not a single mosque that has been bombed by uh, Boko Haram. Uh, I also want to point out, you have emphasized that the issue in Nigeria is not religious. Uh, now, there are 38 people who were alive yesterday morning who, if they were still on the planet, would beg to differ. Um, my concern with your narrative, sir, is that you describe Nigeria as a country with uh, the sixth largest Muslim uh, population. And as a minority Christian from the north, I find that uh, somewhat offensive because I don't think you should describe us in religious terms if you feel that the conflict uh, is not religiously rooted. In conclusion, I would be very happy to give you a transcript of the rantings of Boko Haram, where they have referred to the religion of Bush as one of the reasons why they are upset. And the last I checked, uh, Bush was the former US president. So sir, they have you also in their sights. Thank you very much. Connie. Connie Freeman, Syracuse University. Um, very nice to see you again, Ambassador Carson. And I greatly enjoyed your remarks, your far-reaching remarks. But I would also note that in the middle there, you were pretty critical of the Nigerian government. And I'm assuming um, that you've talked with them privately on all of these things as well. What I'm interested in has been their reaction. Thanks. Great. That's uh... a... <laughs> we'll come back. One more. Uh, that was a, uh, a large number of, of questions. Let me see if I can do short answers and do justice to, to, uh, to, to all of these uh, issues. Uh, uh, Jennifer actually started 
uh, off uh, with three questions. Um, and, and, and let me just say in, in, in response that I think that some of the uh, um, macroeconomic reforms that are being advocated uh, by the finance minister, Dr. Ngozi, and her colleagues will, in effect, uh, generate uh, more government uh, revenues that can be spent to address uh, the economic and social uh, problems that the country uh, as a whole faces. Uh, one of those major changes was something that was uh, attempted uh, at uh, Christmas and New Year's, and that was the removal of the gasoline uh, subsidy. Uh, the President uh, attempted uh, but failed uh, to completely uh, reduce the entire uh, subsidy, which would have uh, generated uh, some uh, $9 billion uh, in foreign exchange uh, revenues that could have been used for other purposes. The uh, fuel subsidy uh, subsidizes uh, uh, large numbers of uh, people uh, in a disproportionate uh, manner. Uh, those who are mostly benefiting uh, from those subsidies are individuals uh, who have uh, automobiles, who are running generators, uh, and uh, are uh, effectively uh, using government uh, monies uh, to operate uh, and live off of when some of that money uh, could be going for other purposes. So things like that will have an impact. Economic reform will have an impact. Uh, uh, deregulating uh, the uh, distribution of power uh, selling off uh, some of the uh, electrical generation facilities that have been working not at all or at very low levels uh, allows for infusions of cash into the system while also bringing in outside investment and uh, also providing uh, an uptick in service. So I think macroeconomic reforms at the upper level uh, combined with good government services delivery can, in fact, uh, have a positive outcome. And I think that uh, we should applaud the work of the, the, the economic uh, reformers. And it's not just uh, one or two or three. I've mentioned several uh, who are there very clearly and very prominently a, a part of the reform uh, effort. Let me say, uh, in response to uh, uh, your question about uh, the North and representation there, Secretary Clinton uh, believes very, very strongly uh, that we should be uh, represented uh, in uh, northern uh, Nigeria. Uh, the Secretary uh, has said uh, that she wants uh, us to reopen uh, a uh, consulate uh, in the north, uh, and we are actively looking around for uh, a location. Uh, and uh, a place uh, where we can uh, operate uh, there. It has been uh, a goal of the uh, Secretary to do this, uh, and efforts are, are underway uh, to make this happen. We have uh, identified uh, positions uh, for Foreign Service officers, uh, and we have uh, a pot of money uh, that we are trying to operate uh, within. Uh, Northern uh, Nigeria, uh, deserves our attention, uh, and it deserves our diplomatic uh, representation. And we hope, as we are diplomatically represented there, uh, that our colleagues uh, in uh, USAID uh, will also be there as well. Finally, on that uh, last question, too, uh, about uh, focusing more, yes, uh, we are uh, trying to focus more. We have highlighted our uh, and focused our support in the north to several states. Uh, but we are looking at opportunities to uh, be able to expand what we uh, do uh, in the north. Uh, recognition uh, of the problem uh, is insufficient without a response. Uh, and that uh, goes uh, for the U.S. government, the international community, uh, as it does uh, for Nigeria. Uh, recognition uh, of the problem is insufficient uh, without an appropriate response. Uh, we say it for ourselves. 
uh, and uh, that is how we are looking at it. Um, first Nigerian uh, commentator who is uh, here from uh, Foundation, we welcome you to Washington. We welcome you to uh, these kinds of lively uh, discussions uh, uh, about uh, policy and, and what we are trying to accomplish here in Washington. Uh, our concern uh, for Nigeria uh, is not simply uh, a concern uh, for the North. Uh, it is a concern for all uh, Nigerians, uh, whether they live in uh, Lagos, Calabar, uh, or Port Harcourt, uh, whether they live in the Middle Belt in Jos uh, or Abuja, or whether they live in Kano uh, or Kaduna, uh, Madugri, uh, Bauchi, or any other uh, area. Uh, we do focus uh, attention uh, on the north because we think uh, that uh, that part uh, of the country, uh, because of the social indicators, uh, is doing uh, worse uh, than other parts. And we think that in order to uh, address some of the social and economic uh, problems uh, that are there, uh, we need to turn our attention uh, at trying to uh, level uh, uh, the playing field a little bit so that more will uh, get done in, in a part of the uh, Nigeria uh, that has suffered uh, a greater uh, impoverishment. But we're concerned about uh, the activities of the, of the middle belt. Second, uh, uh, I know that uh, Nigeria has uh, many, many uh, different uh, ethnic communities and we're not trying to single uh, any one of them uh, out for uh, favoritism. Uh, we, uh, in this country, like you in Nigeria, uh, live in a, uh, in a large nation uh, with diverse uh, religious and ethnic communities. I would dare say that uh, probably uh, every significant uh, ethnic group uh, around the world has a resident here in this country that we live in. Uh, and we look not uh, at uh, our differences uh, as points of friction, uh, but our diversity uh, as points of strength, and we hope Nigeria will see that as well. Um, so we're interested in all Nigerians, uh, whether they're from uh, the South, the Middle Belt, uh, or the North. Um, let me just say that uh, with respect to uh, Boko Haram, uh, Boko Haram, as is, is the uh, Emmanuel, uh, our lawyer, has said, uh, is not and has not been uh, designated uh, as a uh, foreign uh, terrorist uh, um, uh, organization. Uh, but that does not uh, prevent us uh, from uh, working uh, with uh, government officials to try to uh, identify and find those individuals who are carrying out uh, terrorist uh, uh, attacks uh, against not only Nigerians, uh, but members of the uh, international uh, community. Uh, and I think that we should uh, remain uh, focused on uh, trying to find those individuals, bringing them uh, and helping the Nigerian government bring them to, uh, to, to justice. Uh, by help, uh, help can range uh, over a number of areas, uh, and it can uh, range from uh, criminal investigations. Uh, it can uh, be the exploitation of uh, materials that have been captured in order to uh, lead to the arrest and apprehension of individuals. Uh, it, can lead, it can be the uh, forensic analysis uh, that is done in a post-blast situation in order to be able to trace the kinds of materials that have been put together so that one can go back and uh, find the individuals who may have purchased them or put them together. Uh, and many of those things are, are in fact uh, happening, uh, thanks in large measure to the work of our uh, FBI agents uh, who uh, work uh, uh, in our embassy and out of our embassy uh, in Abuja and also out of our consulate uh, in uh, Lagos. Uh, so we are looking, but we also uh, make uh, recommendations, uh, and we hope that some of the recommendations that we make, which are made uh, as a friend and a partner, uh, will be heard uh, and will be listened to. But ultimately, uh, the decisions uh, about what to do and how to do them 
uh, rests with the Nigerian uh, government. Uh, we ourselves, as you well know, have had some experience in dealing uh, with uh, terrorism uh, over the last uh, decade, uh, and uh, we may have a few things uh, that we've learned uh, that may be helpful to others uh, as they deal with the problems uh, that they confront. And we hope that uh, they will be helpful and they will be used uh, in a, uh, an effective uh, manner uh, to help uh, uh, go after people who are largely, largely going after uh, Nigerian uh, 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 officials, security forces, uh, and entities in order to discredit uh, the state. <coughs> Connie, you had a question about government reaction. Uh, to uh, our concerns. Uh, we have uh, a very good, a very robust, uh, and a very positive engagement with Nigeria. Uh, a lot of that is done uh, through the uh, U.S.-Nigerian uh, Binational Commission, and a lot is done through uh, our dialogues. Um, I don't uh, mean to, to be flippant when I say that uh, the relationship is close. I mentioned that the EFCC commissioner is in town today. He was in town, but he was uh, at the State Department uh, being hosted uh, by Undersecretary uh, Maria Otero. Uh, I mentioned that the Vice President of Nigeria uh, will be in town uh, as of early tomorrow morning. Uh, he, today, today uh, the Ambassador Adifuye said, uh, he will be meeting uh, later in the week with Vice President Biden at the White House. He will be at the State Department where he will be hosted and seen by senior uh, leadership there. Uh, the Secretary uh, is, uh, has had a, a good relationship with uh, President Goodluck Jonathan. We met with President uh, Jonathan uh, just a month ago uh, in London. Uh, he was accompanied by the Foreign Minister as well as the National Security Advisor. Uh, it was a second meeting uh, between the two in, in less than six months. We met uh, with him uh, in uh, New York, again, with the foreign minister, the national security advisor, and with President Goodluck Jonathan. Uh, and our embassy uh, has uh, access and robust dialogue. The uh, U.S. Binational Commission works well. Uh, we want it to work effectively. Uh, we want it to work not just to deal with issues related to uh, security uh, and counterterrorism issues. Uh, we want it to, to work well uh, in the energy sector, sec sector, in the infrastructure sector, in the agricultural sector. Um, uh, we are serious about uh, the importance uh, of our relationship with Nigeria, uh, and we are trying uh, from our side uh, to make it as vigorous as, as possible with, uh, with a dialogue that we hope will uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the level of our commitment. Great. Let's go for um, Pauline. Thank you. Uh, Pauline Baker, the Fund for Peace. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Carson. Um, President Jonathan had once said, and there had been no follow up on it, that. Um, there were elements of Boko Haram in the security forces and in the civil service. What credence do you give to this assertion, and what is the, what is the Nigerian government doing about it? And then in the back. Up front first, and then we'll go back. Niyakwete uh, with Adna. With um, due apologies, Mr. Ambassador, may I take you to Mali? Um, I noticed that you were in, um, reports said you were in Algeria talking with the Algerians and it seems to me that is a great move because of their influence. On the other hand, um, days after the coup, State uh, Department uh, officials seem to be saying that there were, the, the coup makers had grievances for making the coup and that took some of us aback and they mentioned some incidents. Um, if you could please share some light on those incidents that seem to give a reason for the coup. Thank you. Side trip to Mali, and now we'll, um, the gentleman in the aisle, yeah. Thank you, Gregory Treat from Jubilee Campaign. Um, I'm, I'm aware that there was a House Homeland Security Committee uh, hearing and report which recommended to return to uh, what the Nigerian lawyer raised about the foreign terrorist designation. 
uh, that uh, that committee hearing and report recommended that uh, Boko Haram be designated an FTO, um, and it seems like we put a lot of different groups on the FTO list. Uh, uh, the Iranian opposition jumps to mind. So, is there is there some compelling reason why we're not putting Boko Haram on the terrorist group when even in your common conversation to talk about what they do, you use the term terrorist attacks? And uh, second, uh, I am aware in the, the International Religious Freedom Act and several other acts, there are provisions that uh, we would use to make specific people not allowed to travel to, to help uh, uh, freeze their international accounts. Are any uh, actions like that contemplated, even if a foreign terrorist designation is not? Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't turn this back on. Let me first of all respond to uh, Pauline Baker's uh, uh, question. Uh, I'm f I've seen the the reports that that you refer to about uh, possibly uh, Boko Haram elements being in the security forces and the police. I have no independent uh, evidence uh, to uh, comment on that one way or another. I just I just uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know, uh, and uh, and we don't know. So I, I have no comment on it, uh, one way or another. So uh, let me uh, go uh, to the, the the question of of Mali. Uh, I was in fact in, in in Algiers up until you know Thursday of, of last week, um, and uh, coming out of uh, coming out of West Africa. First of all, uh, with respect to Mali, I want to uh, applaud uh, the uh, uh, enormously good work of ECOWAS uh, and of President Alison uh, Ouattara, uh, his foreign minister Duncan, uh, President Blaise Kampori uh, of Burkina Faso, uh, and his foreign uh, minister uh, Basoli but also each and every one of the ECOWAS heads of state and governments for standing up and saying that the era of coup d'etats in West Africa, in the West African ECOWAS uh, zone uh, is past uh, and that coup leaders uh, will not be accommodated and coups uh, will not be accepted. Uh, they have uh, been resolute uh, they have been firm, uh, and they have been clear. Uh, this uh, is not uh, going to be tolerated. Uh, this uh, is uh, an achievement uh, not only uh, for uh, ECOWAS, but it is a, a long, proud statement uh, for where uh, democracy and respect for democracy uh, and the rule of law uh, has come uh, in West Africa. Uh, uh, Captain uh, Sonogo, uh, as of uh, yesterday, uh, was said to have uh, turned uh, uh, over power back to uh, civilians, uh, and a transition uh, appears to be uh, underway. Uh, what uh, Captain uh, Sonogo did uh, was uh, illegal, uh, unexpected, and it destroyed 20 years of progressive democratic uh, progress. Uh, it undercut uh, what many people uh, in Africa uh, are fighting uh, to attain. We hope that it has been rolled back. With respect to the issue uh, of grievances, uh, Captain Sonogo uh, and uh, his uh, people were uh, saying that they felt uh, that the government was not uh, providing them with the kind of supports, assistance, uh, and logistical support they needed uh, to deal with the uh, issue uh, of uh, the rebellions uh, in the northern part of that uh, country. And that may be true. And if it is true, one has to, to, to look and see uh, how much of it uh, was there. So yes, one does look at the concerns that they raise, but none of those concerns rises high enough to the level of uh, being insubordinate, as every soldier should uh, not be, to civilian authority. You know, his job was to defend the state, 
and it, by carrying out a coup d'etat, he undermined democracy, and he also left the state vulnerable in the north to what has now happened uh, with a Tuareg uh, and a AQIM takeover. He, in effect, has contributed to the very thing he and his men said they were trying uh, to prevent. We will see how this plays out. Uh, but again, our position has been very, very clear from the very, very beginning. Uh, uh, we don't uh, support uh, these kinds of actions. Uh, they undermine democracy, uh, and uh, we are not, uh, we're not going to, uh, to, to do it. I think ECOWAS deserves a, a lot of praise for what they've uh, done, and if they've, they're able to successfully roll this back, uh, it's a triumph for where uh, they are, and it's a triumph for the nature of the organization uh, that they're a part of. Again, hats off to uh, President uh, Ouattara, hats off to uh, President uh, Kampori and their, uh, and, their, uh, and their colleagues there. Uh, and it's a, a good example. Uh, democracy uh, is not in recession uh, or in a closet uh, hiding in Africa. Uh, it is on the move, and we have seen uh, a number of instances over the past 18 months, going all the way back to what we saw uh, in Guinea-Conakry, uh, when we saw uh, Dadis Kamra uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, General Kouyaté move on, uh, all the way up uh, to what we've seen just in the last three weeks. Uh, extraordinarily successful elections uh, in Senegal that have brought uh, President Macky Sall to power in a triumph, 65-35, in favor of him over President Wad, and probably one of the best run elections I've seen, and I was out there. Uh, we've uh, also uh, uh, seen uh, the successful transition uh, just this past weekend uh, with the unfortunate and untimely death of uh, President uh, Mutharika uh, and the uh, successful transition to Africa's uh, second uh, female president uh, in President uh, Joyce Banda. Uh, and again, the ECOWAS uh, standing up and saying no is also uh, a strong firm. People across Africa want the dignity that democracy brings and the opportunity. And, and we're committed wherever possible to helping that uh, along. Last uh, question on, on, uh, on the uh, Boko Haram uh, coming back. Just because Boko Haram is not designated as a foreign terrorist uh, operation or organization does not uh, prevent us uh, from uh, taking action against individuals uh, who we believe are engaged uh, in terrorist uh, uh, activities. Uh, and it is not uh, uh, a, uh, an essential uh, item uh, to uh, engage. Uh, as I say, we are engaged right now uh, in providing a whole range of, of, uh, of uh, training and assist programs, uh, and we will continue to be engaged uh, whether they are designated we're not designated. Uh, we have the ability to do so, uh, and we're doing uh, and exercising that ability on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for the nice group. Do I have to say what my name is? Yes. <laughs> okay, my name is Amadou Abubakar, and I'm um, you who know Nigeria, you can see the way I'm dressed, like, obviously I'm a northerner, right? <laughs> okay, um, there are two issues I want to address from, unfortunately I didn't hear your speech, I came in late, but uh, in answer to one of the questions, uh, two things were clear. Uh, number one, you were answering a question and you kept making reference to middle belt, middle belt, middle belt. Uh, Mr. Carson, as Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, I need to remind you that um, Nigeria is divided into six geopolitical zones. Southeast, South-South, Southwest, Northeast, 
Northwest, and North Central. And as a high-ranking U.S. official, I strongly suggest that when you discuss Nigeria, you restrict yourself to the official designations because there's no such territory in Nigeria that's officially recognized as um, the Middle Belt. But I can understand where you're coming from. Number two. Briefly. Yeah. On the issue of FTO. F FTO designation. F I would like to let you guys understand that <coughs> there is no way at all that this so-called Boko Haram thing is ever going to be of any threat to the US. The United States has had a long presence in Nigeria. Earlier on, you were making reference to Secretary Clinton wanting a stronger presence in the North. When I was growing up, I mean, there were two embassies, two consuls, one in Kano, one in Kaduna. So it's not like northerners have any inherent Afghanistan type of hatred for the US. And I'm sure you should know that. There is no region in Nigeria that has not, in the history of Nigeria, been the problem for Nigeria. At one time, it was Eastern Nigeria. At another time, it was uh, Western Nigeria. Not too long ago, it was the Niger Delta. It just happens now that it's the northern part of the country. OK. OK? So um, I need to remind you to keep this in mind. OK. Thanks. Um, let's see. Let's go back over here. Um, OK, the gentleman on the aisle, and then Steve. Oh, the lady on the aisle. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Esther. I am very pleased to have this mic. I have been raising my hand for a long time. Uh, <laughs> as, as one of the youth activists that voted to, uh, during the elections and also monitored the elections, I am pleased to say that the role of the young people during the election was very, very important. We even developed a software to monitor the election. We had a project called Register, Select, Vote and Protect. And that has actually given Nigeria a very good impression about the election. I am very excited about that. So secondly, I know that the conflict in Nigeria has a youth phase. I want to tell you that the young people are writing a new narrative about Nigeria. And I want to see that the US Department support that effort towards making sure that the young people in Nigeria are empowered, are inspired like the PSC in the US to be able to engage about local and global scene to make sure that Nigeria is you know, moving forward from what we constantly know. Thank you. Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. Um, I know most people come here for a political reason. We come here for an economic trade reason. And Johnny Carson, Ambassador Carson, we never told you this, but we people who work in trade built you a statue and an appreciation when at this very place last year you mentioned your wish list for AGOA. Unfortunately, it didn't come true, but it was a good wish list. We have two suicidal missions we'd like to give you today and so on, and if you don't do it, we certainly understand. Number one, the U.S. made a mistake, and we should admit it, in terms of who we nominated for the World Bank president. And I would hope that Mr. Obama possibly could make a statement and use diplomacy and say, you know, the Korean doctor is great. There's already a Korean who runs the UN. We ought to make sure he's the next president to the WHO and the World Health Organization, and I won't tell you who we think should be the World Bank. Sometimes it really gets support, and particularly in Nigeria with the statement. A second issue is a little more erudite, but I do want to mention it, and that is the fact that Nigeria has stood up for the U.S. for the last year in order to prevent the EU from foisting on them a preferential system called economic partnership agreements under which U.S. exports would would be subject to a 25% higher duty than EU exports. And Nigeria is one of three of the 57, 47 countries that had done that, and so on. Again, short suggestion without going into great detail. Talk to your economic people about it. But it would certainly make sense if at the G20 that's taking place in Puerto Vallarta, or the G8 that's taken in Atlanta, if the US might suggest to the 
Europeans, you know something? We all want regional integration. You can't have regional integration if you force some countries and not others to sign, quote, preferential agreements. Let's give them to 2020. Let's see if Africa can form the continental free trade agreement that is done. So the two very simple suggestions is <laughs> have Great. President Obama say, let's move on and get Ndazi in the job that she certainly deserves. And number two, tell the EU to take off the damn pressure, let Africa region become integrated, strong, as you said with ECOWAS. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Let me do a reverse order and start with Steve. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your uh, very uh, keen uh, suggestions. Um, uh, as a uh, senior official at the uh, at the State Department, uh, I have to say uh, that uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Ngozi is a an extremely articulate. Uh, well-educated and qualified uh, individual. Uh, but I also think uh, that uh, Dr. Kim, uh, who I would describe uh, as an American and uh, not as a Korean doctor, all out of deference, but as an American uh, is also uh, a uh, distinguished uh, development uh, expert. And we think that uh, his uh, skills and abilities uh, make him, uh, for us, a better place at this time to, to leave the, the bank. But your views are appreciated, uh, and I'm sure they're warmly received. Uh, but I uh, have to say that uh, it's important uh, that uh, we continue to, uh, to, uh, to, to encourage uh, our, our own candidate to, to, uh, to, to that position. Uh, on the trade question, uh, we're aware of it uh, and uh, what is happening, and uh, we are encouraging that the uh, playing field be level. Uh, I thought you really were going to ask me for a really difficult question, but you didn't raise it, and so I'm not either um, <laughs> on the economic side. I did have a, a nice answer for it, but I'm not going to prolong this. I'm just going to say that uh, we uh, are – uh, very respectful of Nigeria for taking the uh, very uh, fair and principled position that it has taken, and we hope that others will follow Nigeria uh, along that path. Um, Esther, let me, uh, if I could, uh, say I am extremely happy uh, that you uh, have uh, mentioned uh, youth and the role of youth. One of the most impressive things uh, that I saw in Nigeria during the election was the very energetic, very positive, uh, uh, very powerful, and most important, very neutral uh, role that the uh, National Service Corps youth played uh, around the country because it was members of the, uh, the, na the country's National Service Corps who were the backbone uh, of the uh, election uh, uh, organization. Uh, without them, uh, Professor Jaga would not have had uh, a structure. Uh, they were the registrars. Uh, they were the uh, validators. Uh, they were the counters. They were everywhere, and they did the job just wonderfully. Uh, young Nigerians, you know, 18 to, to, to 30, uh, university graduates, university students in their green T-shirts, uh, very distinguished, uh, did a wonderful job. And they were dispersed across the country, all 36 states. No regions, all 36 <laughs> states. Uh, 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 people working from one area to another, wherever they happen to be serving, on behalf of their country, uh, they were allowed uh, to uh, man those voting booths. We ourselves here in Washington have put a very special emphasis uh, on youth, and it, sometimes uh, it is missed. In uh, 2010, uh, President Obama uh, uh, invited uh, uh, two, a uh, minimum of two, sometimes three, young African leaders uh, from across Africa 
for a week-long visit to the, the White House, uh, culminating uh, in a 90-minute uh, uh, town hall in which uh, he spoke for approximately four or five minutes and then opened it up to questions uh, from all of the young uh, African young leaders who were, uh, who were, were invited to this uh, event. It was spectacular. The week started with uh, a uh, speech to this group by uh, Secretary Clinton at the State Department, followed by speeches from a number of the assistant secretaries, and then they were interspersed around various government agencies with uh, companies, uh, and uh, the last event being the meeting at the White House. It was a marvelous occasion for those who were there and, and missed by many uh, in this town because things like that don't get very much uh, attention. Uh, last year, uh, the First Lady uh, did a similar event uh, in Johannesburg where she invited young women from across Africa to come to uh, Johannesburg to participate uh, in a similar uh, youth event. Uh, young women from across the continent, uh, women uh, who will be the future leaders of their uh, country. And as we prepare and move into this year, uh, we are looking at doing uh, something very much uh, like this, uh, probably even on a grander scale, where we will in be inviting uh, Africa's next generation uh, of leaders uh, to come. And a lot of this has been built around an elaborate program uh, put to, together uh, by Bruce Wharton, one of my deputies, by David Gilmore, one of his uh, top uh, uh, deputies uh, who's here with us, uh, where we have tried to uh, keep this next generation uh, interlinked uh, on the Internet through networking. And uh, this year's programs are going to be even more elaborate because what we've decided to do is also to bring in uh, American youth and to put a very heavy focus on technology uh, and, uh, and communication and, and networking. I hope this will be signature that it will continue to, to, to go on. And we try to reach out to them. When I travel, my deputies travel, to go and see some of the, the, the young leaders who, uh, who uh, we've been able to, to bring here. Youth is absolutely uh, important. And the focus uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania, focus down at the State Department with the Secretary has been youth and women and girls. And, and, and that focus is really very, very intense. And we're right now very much in, in a ramp-up stage looking for our next uh, youth event. Uh, but again, we're inspired by things that, uh, that the Nigerian uh, Youth Corps did uh, at the election, and we, we, we mean it uh, very, very uh, seriously committed to it. Let me just say about uh, that part of uh, Nigeria, uh, which uh, uh, divides two geographical zones. I won't uh, call it uh, by any name, but I heard uh, a questioner uh, who happened to be a legal uh, person who was uh, asking me a question use that term, and so I used it. But uh, I will always uh, be careful about how I use it and just simply say Nigeria is a large country uh, divided into 36 states, uh, many of them very different. Uh, like the states we have in the United States. Some east, some west, some north, some south, uh, with different topographies, different politics, and different political makeups. But anyway, you know, <laughs> they're there. I'll, I'll talk about those 36 states. And <laughs> Our at time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we'll end on the note of uh, it's, a, it's, it's a big place and, and diverse. Um, let's, let me just say thank you very much, uh, really, for the, the, the speech, but also the question and answer, uh, really emphasizing the importance of Nigeria, the complexity of the place, and uh, um, I think, you know, exhorting us all to find ways that we can to um, ensure that it ultimately succeeds. So thank you very much. Please join me.